Welcome to another edition of the Jayhawker podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System. I am Greg Gurley, along with Wayne Simeon. We are joined by K.J. Adams, who's had just an absolute breakout year for us. So happy to have him join the podcast. Uh, K.J., it's been a, a fun week at the early part of the week. Back last week, it wasn't so much fun. We were up in Ames, dropped a tough one. We are just kind of had no energy, just got beat down. It happens on the road. This league's a monster. But what I love about you and your team is the resiliency and the ability to have a short memory, 48 hours later, come back and and knock off the, the league leader, which was the Texas Longhorns in Allen Fieldhouse. Welcome to the show, KJ Adams. Thank you. I appreciate y'all for having me. So, KJ, before we talk about uh, this uh, breakout year that you're having, man, I want to circle back because you're a key member of that national championship team. You can't celebrate that enough. Uh, though you played sparingly that freshman year, I think you had two of the more important plays during that championship run. Uh, the first being in the Elite Eight uh, in the first half. I don't know if you remember, where we were battling against Miami uh, down, I believe, maybe six points right before the half. Cameron McGusty was in his bag. Coach Self puts you in uh, the last 12 seconds of that half, and you sit down and just have to guard him one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, stay in front of him, block his shot uh, as the buzzer sounds. All the momentum shifts back to us, and, of course, we go on to win that game. And then you think about the national championship game, game on the line. You hadn't been in the game yet. You get subbed in at game point, the, one of the best switch five defenders we've ever seen. Um, then, of course, you guys take care of business that last possession. Talk to us about just kind of that before your breakout season how important it was for you to really embrace the role that you had last year? And then what were those moments like and how did that carry over into this season? Yeah, it was um, it was definitely a difficult uh, decision. I felt like um, I had two seasons, either to, either to redshirt or play for some little minutes that they had last year. And I felt like it, uh, no matter what, I felt like I wanted to play for the experience and just for, even if I get to have to bust my butt just for two minutes or just again, those little little moments I was gonna do, and I feel like I got the the most of what I wanted, and I feel like I got exactly what I wanted out of that year for me. Well, you got exactly what you wanted, and so did every Jayhawk fan. The national championship, which you were a huge part of, and just talk about though how you stayed ready to Wayne's point. You know, not playing for 19 minutes and 30 seconds in the first half of the Miami game, and then essentially 40 minutes in the national championship game, but it takes a special mentality to be ready to go in there in those types of situations. How, how, what was your, what was your mind like when Bill said, KJ, get in there? Well, um, especially when you have tough times like that, where you're not really playing as much and you kind of just have to wait for the moment. You all, I learned during the course, course that you're to be always mentally tough and just be ready because Sometimes I won't play a lot. Sometimes I'll play five, and sometimes I'll just be in when they need me the most. And it just took a whole season just wrapping around mentally. My parents helped me, and it was a long and tough year. But with everything that happened, it was it was worth it because I I got mentally strong. I got a, a mindset as a person. I was just ready for moments like that, no matter what happened during the course of the game. I, I want to expand on that on your mental toughness because. Last year had to be frustrating. You're a superstar out of Austin, Texas, come to Kansas, a lot of guys returning, but yet everybody thinks they're going to play a lot. You're not able to play a ton, but have a big impact. And then this year, everybody around the country is like, what's KU going to do at the five spot? All they got is KJ Adams and he's undersized. Can he do it? And you hear all that noise, but somehow you shut it out and shut everybody up because you're having an unbelievable year and, and proving everybody wrong and the naysayers wrong that thought you're undersized. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a tough situation for me because obviously I'm undersized. Um, a lot of people had a lot of um, misconceptions about that. It's not the traditional um, Kansas five man, but just trusting everybody, my teammates, and just hearing them that they trust me and that the coaches trust me is really all the confirmation that I need. So. Whenever I really get out there, that's really the only voice I can hear and um, focus on. So that's 
really the most important thing is when you have your teammates that have your back and trust you and know you're going to do the right thing for the team. KJ, I remember a conversation that we had kind of about that theme, uh, that narrative, that false narrative kind of around uh, your makeup, your frame. Uh, and it's a way that uh, and, and helping people to understand that you're not undersized and is tapping into your elite athleticism and your, your, your strength and your jumping ability. And I remember I challenged you to dunk everything. And, uh, and then that was right before the border showdown. And then lo and behold, uh, in that Missouri game, in that Indiana game, you had a, a multitude of rim rattling, backboard shaking, monster dunks. And it seemed like that uh, kind of category that people put you in as being undersized kind of kind of left, uh, kind of dissolved a little bit. And so what is it about your mentality now, just as you've seen to be attacking the rim and being more aggressive uh, than you ever have been? Uh, just um, you, there are two things can happen. Um, either I can not go to my athletic ability and just try to play stand up defense and not use my quickness against uh, the other big guards or just use my athleticism and quickness and use it as advantage. Coach always says that he believes that speed beats height. So I try to use that to my advantage as much and just be the most aggressive player I can be because that's the only way I'll last to be competitive if I use my quickness, be aggressive, and use my strength to the fullest. Hey, KJ, a few minutes ago you mentioned we're talking about mental toughness and you brought up your parents. Uh, know your mom and dad very well, talk to them all the time. Uh, your mom's obviously going through a tough stretch. There was a great article in The Athletic uh, last week about your mom and, and how your family is coping with everything. But talk about how strong they are, how that how strong you have to be for them, their support. When, when I'm on the road, your mom or your dad is always at the games. And it's just how important that is to you to have that support system from back home. What's well, amazing, um, I... Obviously, I, I'm, I'm going through a lot at home, and um, for them just to get out of their way and just to come to come some games and just be there for me, it, it would speak volumes because you think that sometimes I, I like to think that I have a hard life, but you really, I have a really good life, and a lot of people are actually going through a lot of real things. So it's good to have my family there and just realize that they're there and just push through it because a lot of stuff that happens with people is when they're not mentally strong, a lot of stuff goes wrong. So just having that mental toughness helps a lot in your life. And in that same conversation, your how important are your teammates? Because they know what you and your mom and dad are going through. How important is the camaraderie of your guys in that locker room? It's good because um, when I notice through these stretches, of they, it's good to know that they care. Everybody in the team has read the article, talked to me about it, and just really lifted me up during this time because a lot of people really didn't know what was going on because I really didn't tell a lot of people. So just knowing that they're there and just knowing that they read the article, took the time out of their day, and just um, it's a really cool thing that the community really lifted me up with a lot of people didn't even know about it. Yeah, thinking about your your family upbringing, you know, your mom was a standout basketball player. Your dad was a standout football player. Uh, but in high school, you played lacrosse, which, you know, in Texas is is a little strange because usually we know that Texas is, is football country. Uh, how did that come about? And then help us to understand what skill in lacrosse is best transferable to the basketball court. Well, I was playing like so. I was playing soccer for most of most of my life, probably like since kindergarten to fourth grade, and then kind of lacrosse was a new next up thing in in Texas. So I kind of took on that and quit quit soccer and just started focusing on lacrosse. That was really like my first love, other than basketball. I would play lacrosse all the time, right around with basketball. So I'd play. I'd be playing both sports year round and really just focusing in. And I think the most important thing that has lacrosse has helped me is probably just um, my quickness on my feet. You have to really be quick and to play defense when you have a stick in your hand and just being maneuverable around the around the field when you have it. To, to Wayne's point, though, it was late. what was and your one of football my patients upbringing? Was having Did you play football sleeping. growing up? He was I played, I played football. 
I this asked him, through eighth is there grade. anything I can do to And then help? after that, I told my I told my dad I was retired from I'm pretty sure he's grade. the only patient ever to like ask me to much. dance at 2 a.m. Well, so you've been a part being now the best nurse year I can and a half in your case just being the best person played with be. the ultimate leader in Ochai Abaji, and he wins Big 12 Player of the Year, Big 12 Tournament Player of the Year, and MOP in the Final Four. He goes to the Utah Jazz. Now you got Jay, Jalen Wilson. And there's a pretty big step to go from a guy to the guy. And that's what Jalen Wilson has done this year. Talk about his leadership, either by example or in that locker room, and just the man that Jalen's become and how he kind of commands that locker room. Well, it's, it's easy to take that role when you have the ultimate leader, as you said, like Ochai Abadji. I feel like he taught me and Jalen about how to be a leader and how to go through stuff and come back. And I think more for Jalen because he was around him much. He started and played with him much. So I think him just taking that role was just mirroring what Ochai did. Ochai was a show first leader and he, he was the hardest work in the room. You can ask anybody on the team and just having your best player be the hardest worker speaks volumes because you couldn't say that anybody worked harder than Ochai. And that's pretty much the most part of being a leader showing and showing as well as you're telling. So I think Ochai really helped Jalen and Jalen has took a lot of that role. And I th feel like he's doing a great job just being a leader and just showing us rather than just showing us. And are you absorbing everything that Jay Will does and Ochai does, as you know, in the natural progression of where you're going to be as a player, you're going to be that guy in the coming years? Yeah, of course. I, I was blessed to have a an amazing group as my freshman year of leaders. I had five, six veterans on the same team that told me how to do things, what to do. And as long as a bunch like transfers, like land where he would be. Uh, a lot of colleges around his years, and he's known what all translates to each college that he went to. So it's really a it's really a testimony of just all the the teammates I had last year that knows what wins and knows how to make a good player. KJ, tell us about the progression in your relationship with Coach Self. Uh, you know, he's notorious for being uh, really really hard on freshmen when they first get in, but then. Uh, there's a moment uh, of trust building and uh, and establishing credibility. And once you've done that as a player, he's one of the most enjoyable guys uh, to, to, to play under. Uh, you've certainly done well in that transition, uh, being a guy that's, you know, uh, sturdy and stable and trustworthy. So what's that progression been like uh, with you and coach? It's kind of been night and day since freshman year and sophomore year. Um, to build his trust, you just have to play your heart out and play defense. And I feel like I've shown him that a lot of my uh, freshman year and and you just got to be mentally strong. And it feels like he he, he actually said this a couple of weeks ago. He said, once you build my trust, I'm I'm one of the best coaches to play around. And I believe that because once you build his trust and he, he knows that what you're capable of and knows that he can make right decisions, he's one of the funnest and easiest coaches to play around. So just building that, it takes a while, but once you get it, it's definitely worth it. Have you noticed? Have you noticed a considerable change in the amount of times he yelled at you and got on you as a freshman to now? <laughs> once you have established that trust, and then you kind of see it as a as a veteran. What does he do to Zuby and Ernest and Grady and MJ? It was like, all right, I've I've been right there, and you talk to those guys and be like, hey, just gain his trust. It'll all be okay. Just shake it off. Have a short memory. Yeah, it's it's, def it's definitely um, it's definitely to good to see like how progression I've had. Like somebody like Zuby, I feel like me and Zuby are kind of was in the same um, situation last year. He's a little bit undersized, and he just plays his butt off to try to get some minutes. But just seeing Zuby and um, and see how he's dealt with it is just like the same as me. I feel like he's got to take it in the chin for a little bit and just realize that it's just all about the process and just take it through because it's it could be frustrating sometimes when it feels like getting yelled at and he's picking up but when you really think about it and look at the stuff that I did last year I felt like a lot of the things that he was saying was right and that's a lot of the stuff that I took to heart to work on so just it's just all about the process and just trying to be the best you can be. 
KJ, we'll, we'll get you out of here with this and and uh, and seeing uh, how extremely effective you've been uh, in that short roll position. Uh, you know, meaning when you set that kind of middle ball screen with Juan, not rolling all the way to the basket, not popping behind the three, but rolling right around to the elbow area. Juan is able to find you and you've been such a proficient playmaker from that spot, showing your ability to shoot the 12 foot jump shot. Of course, you're very stop hard to difficult to stop driving downhill with your right hand. Also showing you're a proficient passer, being able to find guys in the corner, uh, the open three point shooters. Tell us a little bit about the dynamics of having to play from that position and how you've been able to do it so well. Um, I feel like I've been um, doing that uh, a little bit of my life. I, I've been doing that since high school, and we have a great pass like Juan. He doesn't miss when you have an open an open shot or open selection. So it's good having that and just having the confidence to be able to make that plays and being kind of a point forward in that designated area that I have. So it's just it's just good that I perfected, and that's all that I usually work on in practice and just playing game speed. So when it gets to the game, it's it's kind of good to to do it and try to get some counter moves when a lot of the defense try to take away that spot. Well, we got a big uh, week coming up. Uh, Going to go on the road twice, Norman, Oklahoma, on a Saturday, another early start at noon, and then on Tuesday to Stillwater for, a, for an 8 o'clock game. Uh, uh, talk about how the momentum you gained against Texas was great. We've struggled on the road at times, as we've seen uh, Oklahoma. Not sure which Oklahoma team will get the one to beat Alabama by 30 or the, or the one that, that struggled. And, and there's not a hotter team in the Big 12 right now than the Oklahoma State Cowboys. So talk a little bit about your guys' preparation on this upcoming two-game road trip. Well, when you think about our conference, there's really no one that you could ever say that's that's an easy win. A lot of conferences, you can say there's there's an easy win out there, but especially with ours, you're going to have to take it to the chin every every game and play to your play to your um, opponents and just really just stay optimism and just realize that you can get beat by any any team in any night. So, I feel like that goes for every team in the conference. Everybody has to have a head on head on a swivel when everybody's racing for the the Big 12 title, as you can see, that the standings are pretty, pretty close, closer than they've probably ever been in a minute. So I think everybody's just just ready and ready to fight for it. Well, my guy, KJ Adams, I've uh, been so good for us this year. And if you, you're around KJ, like Wayne and I are all the time, always has a smile on his face, most positive guy ever, even like we talked about a few minutes ago about how it was tough as a freshman, not getting those minutes, but uh, obviously raised so well by his mom and dad and, and uh, just one of the great, great kids that we have in our program. I'm out here slumming it in, in uh, Arizona trying to raise some money for Kansas Athletics. I know you all feel really sorry for me. I'm going to hop on a plane. KJ, I will see you tomorrow morning at pregame meal at the Embassy Suites in Norman, Oklahoma. Let's go get one against the Sooners, and I look for another big night from you, my man. Thank you. I really appreciate y'all for having me. Well, we're going to leave you with this, and I know this about blew the roof off of Allen Fieldhouse Monday night. It was the dunk in the second half by Joe Yesifu. We had a, a great game. He came off the bench, gave us that spark that we needed. But this is your Jayhawker podcast call of the week, as said by Brian Haney great voice of the Jayhawks, Joe Yesifu on that breakaway dunk. And let's not forget the great pass by Dewan Harris to deliver to that dunk. This is the Jayhawker Podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System. Jayhawks on a roll. Can they get another stop? They get it into Rice. Fades on Yesifu. He missed. Rebound on the deck. Wando's got it. Ahead to Joe. To the cup. Oh! Two hands jam. Little Joe with the biggest of dunks. He rocks that rim, and KU goes up 11. Hey, Wayne, how about that uh, comment by me? I just got an oh. I didn't say <laughs> that's, that's some cutting-edge color analysis on the Jayhawk radio network. Do you think you can no, do it better? Well, it was really an elite play, and I, I shared an O with you uh, on the other side of the court uh, where I was sitting, but 
Uh, it was so interesting. That was much anticipated because actually Joe had a breakaway earlier in the first half uh, that people were very excited for him uh, to get a chance to throw it down because though he's a smallest guy on the court, he's got the highest vertical leap of about 42 to 44 inches. Uh, and so we were excited to see him. He took the hard foul. And so that uh, that play uh, didn't get a chance to materialize. Uh, but I'm OK with that because it ended up leading into an even better play. The one that we just listened to there. And, and I think Juan's thread the needle pass between two defenders uh, was equally as impressive as Joe Yesifu's ability uh, to fly up over the rim and finish that uh, in a strong way. Well, I, I think you brought up a good point. He went up for that dunk in the first half and got hit hard, and he landed on his face, basically. And so some guys might be a little nervous about trying to do that again in traffic. And I love the fact that he gets knocked down once, and he goes right back and punches on him in the second half, which was one of the defining plays of that game that, that was able to knock off the, the Big 12 leader and wins. And that, that was – I don't want to call it a must win and build it call it a must win, but let's be honest. If we want to win the big 12 title, that was a must win. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly was. And uh, I'll call it a must performance uh, when it comes to our bench production. Uh, and Joe was certainly a big part of that, you know, with his, his 14 points that he scored that game, particularly in a game when the defense is fully keyed and fully locked in on Jalen Wilson, only holding him to, to two points. And, and, and you and I know Joe, very much like KJ. He's such an incredible kid, so nice, such a hard worker. And he's been laboring as of late, um, you know, coming off the bench for the Jayhawks. And uh, it was one of those games where you just felt good for Joe because you were like, man, it's we want something good to happen for this young man. We want a breakout game. We want to have a high-scoring uh, type outing. Uh, because we've known and he's shown himself to be that, even going all the way back to uh, his days at Drake, uh, which got our attention when he had that great tournament run uh, and was scoring in buckets. And so it was a really feel-good story uh, that was capitalized by an incredible play that we that we saw there uh, from Joe Yesifu. Well, and what we really need, quite honestly, is bench production. And Joe provided that on Monday. Jay Will struggles, only has two points. It's kind of interesting that last year's game against Texas, Ochai Abaji struggled, only had one field goal, and we beat him. I mean, it, that shows you the resiliency of the other guys. The bench is something we've talked about a ton throughout the year. Joe gave us great minutes. Ernest came in, played about 11 minutes, and it was three of three. It provides that energy and athleticism and that spark. So Joe and Ernest coming to that game, I thought MJ Rice was good. And granted, he was only one of five. But defensively, he was dialed in. He was quick to the ball. He had a couple of nice assists. And so those little things in big time moments will only help us moving forward. Because when you're uh, like we talked about with KJ, when you only get a couple minutes and you're not able to produce, you may not get those couple minutes in the second half. And, and that's kind of been the struggle for MJ Rice. He's never he's never had to experience something like this because he's always been the star. But I thought he came in and gave us really positive minutes against Texas, obviously Ernest and Joe, and with the injuries to Zach and, and uh, uh, Zuby, we had a really short bench. and We talked about that a lot in pregame, but it didn't turn out to hurt us. We learned to play without fouling. Nobody really got in foul trouble, even though I don't know if we had somebody foul out or not, but it didn't matter. Uh, so Michael Jankovic, was our ninth guy. That was it. That's what we had. So if that would have been the K-State game where 71 free throws were shot, we might have been finishing that game with three guys. Yeah, and, you know, I really also like the timing uh, behind that with our bench production uh, because going in to play back-to-back -back road games uh, with two teams that are very capable and that have beat, you know, uh, top-tier uh, competition in the conference, uh, we're going to need that. And uh, you think about some of the, the grit and the resiliency that, that comes from uh, guys needing to step up when your best player isn't playing well. That's going to be needed in March. You know, you think about the six game stretch uh, throughout the tournament that you hope to win six in a row in order to give yourself a chance to, to win uh, the national championship. Your top guy isn't going to play uh, to the best of his ability all six of those games there's going to be ugly games there's going to be low scoring games there's going to be you know foul issues there could be an injury or two 
And that's where you really need guys six through eight that you can really depend on. Like KJ Adams was that for us last year, um, which helped us be able to, uh, to, to propel ourselves on to, to having a banner type year. So hopefully this is something that uh, Joe and that, Zo uh, that Ernest and that, uh, that MJ and eventually Zuby, once he gets healthy, can continue to build on so we can have a good upward trajectory uh, into, you know, the, 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 the final of, of the regular season and then get more. Well, what you just said, Wayne, was exactly what happened last year. As much as we talk about Ochai, player of the year type stuff, he struggled late in the year. He wasn't great in those first couple games in the NCAA tournament. It took Remy Martin and others to step up to propel us to the Final Four and ultimately a national championship. You don't win national titles, or very rarely do you win national titles with one guy. It takes four, five, six. I mean, Danny and the Miracles is a great example. Danny was the guy. He was the alpha dog, no question about it. Uh, but you have to have the Chris Pipers and the Kevin Pritchards and the, and the Milt Newtons, or you don't win it. And, and that's what we proved the other night. That's what we proved last year. And moving forward to this weekend and Tuesday, it's going to take a, a, a resiliency for us to step up and play better on the road. So let's go back to last week. Iowa State, one of the big keys was got to take care of the basketball. What happens? We have 20 turnovers. And we had a chance in that second half. I think we cut it to six. But things don't go well for you on the road. and The ball bounced their way. and A lot of uh, unforced errors on our part uh, gave Iowa State. A, I don't even know how much they won by it. I lost track, but it was – a loss is a loss. So now we go to Oklahoma. And what happened the first time we played Oklahoma in Allen Fieldhouse, where we're great? We're down 10 with five minutes to go. And we have a great comeback and we beat them. So they're sitting there going, we let one get away at Allen Fieldhouse. They're coming to Lloyd Noble on Saturday. We got to take care of business. And then New Year's Eve, we played Oklahoma State. And that wasn't exactly a cakewalk. That was back when Oklahoma State wasn't really clicking on all cylinders. But right now, is there a hotter team in the Big 12 than the Cowboys with athletes all over the place, bodies, fouls? They got it all. So it's a massive stretch. If you want to win the Big 12 title, you got to take care of business on the road in Norman and Stillwater. Yeah, no, it's so true what you said there. And this is a, a, a really tough stretch, even though they're, they're, they're non-ranked opponents and maybe they're uh, kind of hovering around the bottom half of the conference standings, but they are capable. And uh, even when you look at the shape up of the schedule, uh, it always concerns me when we play a Big 12 opponent in the field house at home first. They play us close and then they feel like, hey, we should be able to get them when they come to our place. Like these two teams, no matter how they play the last two or three games, have confidence uh, about how they played us in the field house because really no one's supposed to come and beat us in the field house. That would have been house money anyways. I want to circle back to what you said about, about the Iowa State game and then the Texas game. The difference between those two, I feel, is fully directed towards our point guard, Dewan Harris. The, the, the energy and the focus and the activity that he came out against with Texas, the first four possessions, you could just see and feel that, man, it was going to be a different type of game. We didn't see that in Ames, Iowa. All right, We didn't see it the entirety of the game, and we labored. I'd be interested to know what the stats are in terms of our production when Juan scores over 10 points. I love that, that he scored the first two baskets in the Texas game he was assertive. He was attacking the paint. He was getting downhill. Now, of course, we know he's not an elite scorer. He's not a score first mentality. But when he has an opportunity to get easy baskets, man, we really, really need him to. And for me, the key moving forward in this season is Juan being assertive offensively to make sure that, man, he can help score at least 10 points a game to where it lightens the load of putting pressure on a Grady and a Kevin McCullough, even a Jay Will. And you know what? When he does a better job finishing at the rim, the defenses have to give attention to that, and it creates more opportunity for guys around him to where now he can originally distribute the basketball like we know he's more prone to. Well, no question about it. I mean, 
go on is so dangerous. Like you said, when he gets to the bucket and finishes, or he hits his little running one-handers, then the big guy on those pick and, pick and roll on the left side, he's so good with KJ, so good with Ernest, or that short pop like you talked about with KJ, right out in the middle of the court, KJ rolls the free throw line. But when he can turn the corner and get a big guy to commit, if the big guy commits, you throw it up for an alley-oop. If the big guy doesn't commit, then you go in and, and get a little giant killer or you get a, a layup. And DeWan's so good at that. Shot the ball 16 times against Texas, which that's Texas is probably like, all right, if we get if we get DeWan Harris to shoot the ball 16 times, Jalen Wilson to score two points, how the hell do we lose this game? You know, that <laughs> was more than likely, that was more than likely their game plan. It's like, if we can get a guy who scored over 20 points in the last six games to have two and a guy who's somewhat offensively challenged to shoot it 16 times, we should have a pretty good chance of winning in their building. And it just didn't happen. And that's because of Kevin McCuller. That's because of KJ Adams. That's Joe Yesifu. That's Ernest. And obviously, Dewan was, was spectacular. And, and he was able to do, you know, we also lose sight of how hard it is to be so good offensively and then be the elite defender that he is. Bill and I talked about it after the uh, uh, game the other night against K-State about how good Dewan was on Noel, but he was also good offensively. And Devontae did that in Norman a few years ago with Buddy Heald and had, I think, 25 points offensively and shut down Buddy Heald, or as much as you can shut down Buddy Heald. Uh, but it's hard to do it on both ends. Yeah, it really is. But I'll tell you what, and you know this uh, just as well as most, is that there is an expectation that Coach Self has for every player uh, to make sure that they're a two-way player. Um, you know, th th there's no room for guys that just want to uh, use most of their energy up and their skill set up and their attention to detail up on the offensive end and then take possessions off when it comes to the defensive end. I actually thought that Jalen Wilson – uh, did a great job on the defensive end uh, for the most part uh, during uh, the game against Texas. And he's shown himself to be a solid defender, um, guarded being able to guard multiple positions, um, you know, as he's as you even look at his full body of work uh, throughout this campaign that he's on, not just in his ability to score uh, in, in gobs. And, you know, it's one of the things that I think Grady Dick is developing in terms of his ability uh, to be able to play on both ends of the court. Now it's just going to be, kind of kind of par for the course as you know people are going to see and and of course as we switch four switch five sometimes people looking for the right matchup teams are going to try to pick on him teams try to pick on joseph yesifu when he's in the game uh you know with his size limitations and so uh but that doesn't give any any guy no matter what their offensive output is uh an easy out to take possessions off on the defensive end Defense travels, that's part of the coach self's DNA. It's been a part of his winning strategy for his last 20 years at the helm uh, here at Kansas basketball. It's one of the things that has made us an elite program. It's the thing that's helped add it to a 91% winning percentage under his leadership. And it's something that's going to continue to be needed uh, here throughout the Big 12 season and uh, defending this national championship. No question. Well, this is our sixth podcast, and partners and sponsors are lining up to get involved in the new rebranded, rebranded and reimagined Jacker Podcast. You can get the Jacker Podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Google, wherever you listen to your podcast. Check out the Jayhawker Podcast. But I am excited to announce the Hilton president, which will be the official team hotel of the Kansas Jayhawks during the Big 12 tournament and all trips to Kansas City. Our guy, Wayne, and I know him well. Philip Stranod does an unbelievable job down there. And uh, the stay and play package includes breakfast for two, parking for one vehicle, a welcome gift handed out a check-in. Old school hotel opened in 1927. It's the only hotel in the Power and Light District. Just steps from the T-Mobile Center, Starbucks coffee on site, lobby 213 rooms and suites, Plenty of on-site parking, the best breakfast around. And also, again, parking can be so difficult down there. So look up the Hilton president. Call my man, Phillips Trinod. Appreciate their support of the Jayhawker podcast. Excited to have them on board. And there's many more to come. But uh, to wrap this all up, Wayne, uh, 
exciting week. It's a big week for Kansas basketball. We got to take care of business again if we want to be the elite team that we think we are. We got to start winning those games on the road. Missteps in Manhattan and Waco, uh, where we've struggled, and then obviously Wayne uh, uh, Ames, Iowa, last week. So uh, it's a, it's Bill's home state. We got to go down there. It was a, it was a epic uh, win last year in Norman. And uh, grinded one out early in Stillwater last year, but different teams on both sides of the ball. And and again, if 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 we want to keep pace with Texas, we talk about the gauntlet. Everybody's got to play everybody twice. Uh, there's going to be some things that shake out, but a huge week for Kansas on the road. Man, the whole month of February is going to be fast and furious uh, as it pertains to to the Big Twelve standings. And of course, we got to focus in and take care of business. You know, the back-to-back Oklahoma stretch, of course, it means a lot to Coach Self, being from o- Oklahoma, Oklahoma State alum. Obviously, you want to perform well in front of your friends and family there. Same thing with Coach Jeremy Case, who's from McAllister, Oklahoma. Uh, his ticket list will be uh, hot and heavy with uh, with friends and family uh, coming up there. And then, you know, it is pretty fun, you know, not that that everyone does that, but to watch uh, who's winning who and where, what are the matchups, you know, on Saturdays and Mondays and Tuesdays because, again, uh, that top tier of this conference uh, is so jumbled up, man. I can't even believe we're talking about the Big 12 tournament already, man. March is almost here. What an exciting time uh, to lock into some basketball. And, hey, I love the President Hotel. Like, look, I've been down in the Power Light area. I've stayed at the Lowe's. I've stayed at the Marriott. I think the President Hotel is, is very, very similar to Allen Fieldhouse, Right. Oh, it's got an old oh. soul. It's got an old feel. I love the drum room. I was hanging out down there last uh, uh, last year for, for, for some drinks post game, uh, just enjoying that environment down there. But it, it's got a, a, a feel and a, and a character uh, very much like Allen Fieldhouse that everyone should go go and check out because it's one of the, 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 the historical markers uh, here in the Kansas City area. Well, back you brought up the drum room. I've had many many opportunities to be there and enjoy a on, on the rock Manhattan. The, that's kind of my drink. And so looking forward to big 12 tournament time to be down there at the president, a couple hundred steps to the power and light and the T-Mobile center. So uh, like you said, this season has just flown by really since the national championship, it's almost somewhat of a blur. I mean, it just goes so fast. We're talking about March already. And here we are, February, whatever. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'd be remiss if you and I didn't talk about the other big game on Sunday. What, right what game? Here in Phoenix, Arizona, out in Glendale. I'm out, I've been out here all week and everything. Like, you want the game? You want the game? I go, nah, I can't go to the game. But uh, I said, you know, they televise it. So, and I can save about 12 grand by not going. But uh, I tell you what. Uh, uh, Wayne's a lifer. I'm a lifer. Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, I wore my uh, my Chiefs quarter zip to the Phoenix Open yesterday. And it was so cool to interact with, with Chiefs fans there. It's just a mass of humanity at this golf tournament. And this is the place to be this week. It's crazy. Wayne, what is your prediction for the big game on Sunday? Yeah, very excited again as a, as a homer, a lifelong Chiefs fan. And it, it's interesting uh, you mentioned the, the type of run just that the whole Kansas City area has been on, going all the way back to 14-15 with the Royals and their their World Series runs. And then we get Mahomes and a couple Super Bowl appearances and, of course, getting the Super Bowl and his announcement of being uh, the MVP. And uh, you think about the national championship that, uh, that, that we won on the men's side and, of course, the incredible start that KU football got off to. Man, what an exciting time just to be around here in this area and – and I kind of snapped at my kids the other day, like, man, you, you guys don't deserve this. Like, you don't remember or you haven't had to go through the lean years like I had to, whether it was the Royals or the Chiefs or, or things like that. But uh, this is such an exciting time. Uh, I, I heard a stat uh, earlier in the week, something to say, like, the Chiefs are 55 and three in error when the defense locks down and only gives up 27 points. And uh, I, I like defense. I like Chris Jones and. Uh, he seems dialed in and as hungry as ever. And so uh, my my point prediction is is, is 35-27 uh, with the Chiefs bringing home the title back to Kansas City. Can't wait for another parade. 
uh, to be able to to enjoy during that time. And so I'm looking forward to, to locking in and, and watching the game. I'm going to go even bigger. I think Jalen Hurts is going to be nervous. I don't think he's elite. I think he's great. But Mahomes is elite. And I think he's going to dominate this game. And I think some mistakes on the other side will hurt the Eagles. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to go double digits. I, I, I love it. I, 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 again, it was so fun at the Open yesterday. Got to see fellow Jayhawk Gary Woodland play. I sent a picture to Ben. It was, it was uh, uh, I was with Landon Lucas, Tyler Self, Eric Chenoweth, Gary Woodland, myself, Kevin Kopp, who, Wayne, you know well. That guy is the ultimate host, played football at Kansas from 93 to 97. This is like his dream week. We're in Phoenix <laughs> where he lives. He's got Jayhawks at the golf tournament. He's going to finish up on Sunday and run up to Glendale and go to the game. And so give it up to my guy, Kevin Kopp, one of the all-time great hosts. He's essentially the mayor of Scottsdale, uh, loves the Jayhawks. There's a Jayhawk flag hanging at the Phoenix Open where 700,000 people will walk by that Jayhawk flag. But uh, we hung out with Kirk Herb Street yesterday, all random, just all over the place. You know what I did cool yesterday, deal. Greg? I shoveled snow yesterday. So no one's feeling sorry for you, bro. What is that? No, I, I was not saying that for anyone to feel sorry for me. It was actually kind of a – Puff out my chest, braggadocious <laughs> statement, I guess. Pat myself on the back, but but man, it's a, it's a blast out here. But I'm back to reality tonight, flying to Norman and uh, calling what I love to do, the Jayhawks at the Lloyd Noble Center tomorrow against the Oklahoma Sooners. Let's get a win on Saturday. Let's get a win on Sunday. Let's get a win on Tuesday. And then back to the friendly confines of Allen Fieldhouse a week from today against Baylor for a little revenge game against the Baylor Bears as they took us down in Waco a few weeks ago. My man, been great. I appreciate you doing a remote. I'm sorry I bailed on you this week. We'll be back in the studio next week. Let's have a fun week, and let's get back in the win column on the road. All right, man, let's do it. Rock Chalk. Jay Ocker Podcast brought to you by the University of Kansas Health System. You can catch the podcast. Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Google, wherever you get your podcast. I am Greg Gurley. That is Wayne Simeon, Jericho Podcast. Out. Rock Chop.